here's how social anxiety can screw us over is in your mind, the likelihood of that happening is so high that it's keeping you from taking any chances. So you are actually being more alone and isolated because your anxiety is make is keeping you from taking any of those risks. Paul, uh, this is Dr. Ali Matu. Welcome to the Psych Show. Great to be here. I'm happy to have you. Um, so how can I help? What's going on? Among other things, I'm having trouble with social anxiety mm-hmm. um, at college. And being at college, I don't really have an opportunity to like deal with it. I, I'm going to therapy on campus that's provided for us, but it's not very, it's not very helpful for what I need it to be. It's a lot okay. more like conversational, and I would need more uh, CBT based, and I don't have access to that. How long have you been experiencing social anxiety? Um, it's kind of hard for me to place because I had the feeling for a while, and long before I had words for it. Um, so I want to say it's kind of been my entire life, but I yeah. didn't really notice it actively until around September of last year. What helped you to notice that this is this is might actually be a problem for me? I had a rough night. Um, just a bunch of random inconvenient things happened, and I just kind of had a well an anxiety attack. Mm-hmm. And I ended up um, sitting in a lawn chair of the of my school green at like ten o'clock at night for a half an hour because I didn't want to see people who I had already seen earlier that night. Yeah. Who yeah. people who I was pretty close with. Um it wasn't like they were like sworn enemies or anything. I I liked both of them, but I'd already seen them and I didn't want to see them again for mm-hmm. no discernible reason and I was already like out and about because my roommates were having a party mm-hmm. and I just couldn't deal with that at all. Yeah. That sounds very familiar that that to me sounds like social anxiety and what social anxiety can do is even if it's someone you know well or a group of people that you interact with a lot sometimes social anxiety can just um, make you want to avoid those situations for no logical reason at all Um, and your example also is a good one about how um, how diverse social anxiety is for some people, it's about meeting new people. For some people, it's about seeing people they already know. For some people, it's just about authority figures. So I want to get a little bit better understanding here. What kind of situations are difficult for you? Honestly, a lot of situations. Mm-hmm. Uh, usually, if it's just a bunch of strangers, I'm fine. But it's usually people I know. But it, mm-hmm. it could be any sort of relationship. It could be friends, uh, colleagues, teachers, okay. uh, even really close friends sometimes. I just, like, don't want to see them. And, like, I have a very intense feeling in my chest when I see them, and I don't want to see them. And I just kind of freak out and try to not be seen, which is difficult because I'm a big guy. What was the last time that you remember really feeling um, this? Like, like, is there an example that you're very comfortable sharing with me? It's not necessarily a recent example, but more of a recurring example. Sure, that um, works. I, I have a single in my suite, so I like mm-hmm. live in a room by myself. Mm-hmm. Um, but my roommates... Uh, spend most of their time in like the in the living room, whereas I spend most of my time in my room. Mm-hmm. Um, but my roommates are very loud, mm-hmm. and when they get very loud, uh, and I can hear them, I just I feel uncomfortable, and I feel uncomfortable leaving because if I have to walk out of my room, I have to see them. So if I have to go somewhere, I'll just often put it off or even just skip it. Right. Um, there have been nights where I've just not had dinner or I've had like a, a granola bar or cereal in my room instead of going to get food uh, because I just don't want to deal with walking out of my own room. I'm really sorry, Paul, because that, that, that must be so difficult because that could happen every night. Yeah. I, I try to not be in my room um, early enough. So like I try to be out and about, so I have to go yeah. get dinner from there. So yeah. 
Um, but that's also can be inconvenient because then I have to be out of my room. Right. And and this is how social anxiety can, um, it can so limit us. And uh, in some ways it can, it can make you feel um, imprisoned in, in so many ways. What are you afraid might happen when you do hear your roommates and you want to go out of the room? What do you get concerned might happen if you do that? I don't even know. It's just kind of, it's just kind of like my body shuts off. My brain Mm -hmm. shuts off and it's like, you can't deal with that right now. Reasonably speaking, the worst that's going to happen is that maybe they're a little intoxicated and they say something dumb, not hurtful, not mean, just dumb. And, and then I just kind of look at them and leave. Like, I, I, there's no situation where I'm actually going to get hurt during this. And I know that, and I can say that confidently. But when this comes up, I, I can't, like, I can't get that thought out. It doesn't make sense in the moment. Uh, and when you say you can't get that thought out, which thought are you referring to? Get the rational thought of they're not going to hurt me, like, to overcome the feeling of dread that I have. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense to me. And it makes sense because it doesn't quite reflect your experience. I mean, your experience Mm -hmm. is these social situations have been dreadful in terms of how Mm -hmm. you feel. You feel that dread inside of you. And regardless of what actually happens, it feels so aversive. You mentioned before that you've probably experienced social anxiety for a very long time, if not your whole life. Mm -hmm. And this, I mean, that doesn't surprise me because a lot of people who have social anxiety slip through the cracks. And what I mean by that is a lot of people don't realize we might have social anxiety. Um, For example, you, you go through, you do your schoolwork, you kind of go through the motions, you're not causing a lot of problems. And so the social anxiety isn't really getting picked up. And I mention this because when people have gone through social anxiety for a very long time, it kind of becomes um, the way in which we see the world. And when you're in a social situation and you're someone who has had social anxiety for a very long time, you're more likely to see threats and to experience these intense physical feelings than other people would. So this is a very long way of me saying it makes complete sense to me that um, you might have these fears because you've just, you've had this anxiety for so long and that's what anxiety does. Anxiety increases our perception of threat and the likelihood of danger. That's what it does. It's great when we need it, not so great in everyday social situations. The question becomes what to do, what to do about this. Uh, I'll do the uh, the stereotypical therapist question here. Um, if I had a magic wand and if I could kind of wave that wand and change things, what would things look like? How, how would things be better for you? I think I just would be able to go about my day, uh, interact with who I want, not interact with who I don't want to, um, and just be at peace with that. What would really improve your life right now is if you were able to engage with the people you want to engage with on a daily basis. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. Okay. And Who are some of the types of people? I mean, you don't have to mention names, but are we talking friends, professors, room suite mates, it sounds like? Yeah, I'd I'd say all of the ones you mentioned. Um, Even people who I wouldn't necessarily consider friends, but more of an acquaintance that I might want to get to know better. People that I know. Mm -hmm. A lot of the people that I know are good people, and I want to be able to talk to them. Okay, so here's the good news is the good news is you live in a place where you have a lot of opportunity to practice this. Um, Some people who might watch this video might be in a situation where 
there isn't a lot of people around them or any um, um, easier opportunities to do that. So that's the good news here is in the college campus kind of environment, you've got a lot of opportunities to do that. You mentioned CBT in the beginning, and the main CBT yeah. technique here to help you is exposure therapy. Um, the mm-hmm. way exposure works is um, it, it's about helping you to be in situations so your mind can learn what it needs to to be able to uh, move forward. So uh, me telling you everything's going to be okay, it's not going to work because that's not your lived experience. What your lived experience mm-hmm. is, is being in these situations and feeling that dread, feeling that awful feeling, or maybe being concerned that something bad is going to happen. So what we have to help you with is to help you get experiences that are different. Um, and the only way to really do that is through exposure. So right now, if I were to ask you about those daily relationships and the ones that um a place where you want to start making some change, which which relationship, which situation, which person would it be? I'm, I'm not really sure. It, it's a tough question. So the yeah. way I would think about it is if you could improve a relationship in your life, who would get, get you the, the greatest, um, what relationship would, would get you the most uh, bang for your buck? Or another way to think about it is what's the most pressing um, social situation to improve? The one that is causing you the most distress or the one that's most important for you for for school reasons or for other reasons to improve? I mean, this is a whole other issue, but like there's this one girl that I've been meaning to talk to Mm -hmm. who I'm interested in. um, And I have known her for a while. And so she kind of means a lot to me. But Mm -hmm. again, I mean, that's also just, plain old regular nerves, I think, among the social anxiety problems. But I think if there was one person that I could just snap, turn around and be able to talk to and have it improve my life and give me peace of mind, I think it would be her. What are you afraid might happen if you say the things that you want to say to her? Um, I'm afraid that I'll look like an idiot. Okay. What um, would... Or that will come off as creepy. Got it. Got it. Okay. So let's pretend I'm a fly on the wall. What would mm-hmm. I see if you're acting like an I- idiot or coming across as creepy? W- what would that look like? Well, specifically uh, saying not being able to get the words out um, because yeah. I... There is an actual reason for that. Um, my tongue was tied to the bottom of my mouth mm. for most of my life. I got that surgery when I got my wisdom teeth out when I was 17. Mm-hmm. Um, so my tongue is still getting used to saying words properly. So sometimes mm-hmm. I'll just like say two or three words in the, at the same time and it just comes out as a garbled mess. Yep. Um, so that's, that's a, a legitimate concern of yep. mine. Uh, yep. But also just like saying something that I mean and believe that's just in the wrong context or at the wrong time. Anything else that you're afraid might, might happen um, or a, a reaction from, from her that you might be worried about her doing something or saying something? Cause the way I imagine it is that like the problem would be like she would deal with it in the situation and then like not be okay with it, but like still like, be civil right but then like turn around and tell all of her friends and their friends you know the the gossip mill gets going and then uh all of a sudden i'm a bad guy okay okay so part of this is actually uh, a fear of how you say something how it comes across her reaction to that And then Mm -hmm. that reaction sort of getting out into your local community. Yeah. Um, I feel like my biggest concern here is that I'll just say something the wrong way and that will have an impact. And Mm -hmm. if I had just worded it differently or said it in a different tone, that it could have, that it wouldn't have been as bad. And that I've just 
misrepresented myself um, through the use of word choice or just doing something silly and then now that's permanent that's like on my that's on my transcript now so that's your real fear um it's the core here the thing that's driving all of this is a fear of saying something the wrong way and um a fear of being um of being seen as stupid or fear of being stupid and probably some of the rejection or isolation that might come along with that all right. And here's here's how social anxiety can screw us over is in your mind, the likelihood of that happening is so high that it's keeping you from taking any chances. So you are actually being more alone and al- isolated because your anxiety is, make, is keeping you from taking any of those risks. I got some ideas here of, of what to do um, getting back to CBT. Um, one idea is a coping skill route. So coping skills are um, anything that's going to help you to be in the situation and make contact with the fear that you have. So um, in this kind of situation, I would actually think about if, if the goal is for you to express what you want to say to this person, and one fear is I might not physically be able to get those words out, um, do you think there's a, either a different way of communicating it to her, either uh, DMing or texting, or actually practicing it out, being able to kind of rehearse what you want to say, um, having an outline, like a little cheat sheet on your hand or something like that. Anything like this that might help you to be able to be able to say the things that you want to say? Theoretically, yes. Uh, practically, I haven't had much luck with that. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing about uh, you suggesting like DMs or texting uh, mm-hmm. is that um, for me, um, this is where my ADHD comes in is that I can't like sit down and focus enough to write what I want, mm-hmm. uh, without incessantly rewriting it and reworking it and just like, um, basically obsessing over the fine details. And it could take me an hour to write like a sentence. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and even then I feel like the whole this is where like the the kind of the me too thing comes in where like the uh, just a little bit the stereotype of sliding into her dms right like the the idea of like hounding on a girl just because she's a girl um yeah. that kind of um scares me away from doing that okay. and um the idea of rehearsing it um i don't know it it kind of feels foreign to me to like to rehearse something that's so um, personal. Mm-hmm. I feel like um, for me, it, it needs to come at the moment spontaneously. It needs to be what I'm thinking at the moment. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. So that that's helpful for me to know what you're hoping to do and also what helps and what doesn't help. So um, this then gets into... Um, the exposure for you is really going to be to the unknown of how you come across in this situation with her. So, um, one, uh, there's, there's a couple of ways to, to think about this, um, in terms of what to do. Um, you can try exposure to, similar kind of situations that feel a little bit lower stakes. So for example, if there's um, someone else that you want to express something to, you could try uh, practicing that with the goal of trying to get contact with these fears of fears of being stupid or fears that I'll say something the right, the wrong way. Are there other people that you might have the same kind of fear with, but could feel like it's lower stakes than this, um, this girl that you want to talk to? Not really. No. Sometimes it's, it's actually easier for that person to be someone you're, um, you're close to in this situation 
it might in your situation i mean it might be actually mm-hmm. easier for you to practice with someone you don't even know like I, i'm i'm just thinking about uh someone who's in customer service or like at a store or something like that um would that be well, a little bit easier opened up yeah that just opened up a ton of different ideas oh yeah hit me so yeah absolutely um i mean there's this kid that plays the piano in the lobby of my building every day and he sounds great i've been meaning to tell him that because i am also a pianist yeah um, but i just never get around to it so like oh man paul i think we're on to yeah. something here um mm-hmm. so giving compliments to someone is a big social anxiety exposure i love to recommend um, mm-hmm. And there's a couple of reasons for this. One, um, it, it can be pretty anxiety provoking for a lot of people who have social anxiety to give a compliment because you're kind of putting yourself out there. Um, but number two, another reason why I like that as an exposure is because um, uh, giving an authentic compliment about what someone is doing or what someone has chosen to wear, not like you don't want to compliment people on like... Um, Unlike their uh, things that they don't have choice over, like, for example, um, someone's height or their eye color or things like that. Um, You do want to compliment people on things that they have chosen or things that they've practiced, like this person who plays a piano. Perfect example. Uh, So it will actually help you to be able to better connect with other people. So um, Mm -hmm. could this be a first exposure you could do where you could share exactly what's been on your mind in the moment, authentically, just like you want to do with that other girl, and then share it with this person, and then um, maybe even say something like, you know, I've been wanting to tell you this for so long, because I've, I've really enjoyed hearing your music, and I play piano too, but I've just kind of been anxious to share that, like some version of that. What, what do you think about that? I, yeah, I think that could work. Okay. Okay, so I would... I would start there, and here's what I want you to do um, to make this a, a real uh, good learning experience, and this is bringing in memory science with uh, clinical psychology and exposure therapy. Before you do that, you can write this down on your phone. Um, write down what, are you, what do you think is going to happen, and don't try to be rational here. Just kind of go with what your gut is telling you. What do you think is going to happen? And then write down 0 to 100%. How, how much do you believe that that's true? Like, I'm afraid he's going to ignore me or not hear me or he's going to think I'm stupid or um, he's going to roll his eyes or he's going to say, oh, thank you. That's really nice for you to say. Like, write down those things mm-hmm. and then do the exposure and uh, and part of the exposure is going to be part one is to share authentically how you actually feel about his um, his uh, piano playing, and then um, part two is actually to share. I've wanted I've wanted to tell you this for a long time, but I've really been anxious to tell you. And then really pay attention to what happens with those two things, and then after the exposure write down what actually happened and if your fears came true or not and how do you know Mm -hmm. okay and then i want you to actually repeat this in different kinds of situations so let's actually use use the benefit of people that you don't know don't produce a lot of anxiety let's use that as a starting place to get you more contact and understanding with these fears. I'm just going to share with you some of the things that I've I've assigned to my patients in the past. Um, so going to a cash register and paying with the wrong amount of money. Nowadays, a lot of people don't pay with, with cash. but So this would be something like... Um, you're buying a stick of gum. Um, it's uh, or you don't buy one stick of gum. Who buys one stick of gum? You're buying a pack of gum. It's like two bucks. You pay with one dollar, and the person says, "Oh no, it's two dollars." And you pay with like a dollar fifty, and then they're like, "Sir, it's two dollars." And then you say, "Oh my gosh, sorry. I'm just, I'm just so anxious. I'm not, I'm not thinking clearly." And then you pay with the right amount, something like that, or um, 
you buy something and then you immediately return it and you say, gosh, I was just, you know, I was anxious. I wasn't really thinking right. This isn't the one I wanted. Um, Mm -hmm. Something like that is a good way in, in these kind of situations. Um, What another way you could do is you could do more compliments for other people. So um, you could do a day uh, or it doesn't have to be a whole day. Maybe, maybe like part of the day where you're trying to find someone and authentically compliment them. Like if they're wearing a shirt, of your favorite team but if someone has like a um a star wars shirt and you love star wars say like oh yeah Mm -hmm. nice shirt oh cool thanks man yeah hey did you what you think of the last movie and you know something like that um but you could you could practice giving authentic compliments to other people about their clothing their shirts their things that they do um anything like that like that would be a good way in to get you more contact with this fear the the paying with the wrong amount sounds like a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> just because I I do that like naturally, sometimes yeah. I'll just like I'll just completely mess up. But like that, I I think I think that's a lot to work with. I th- I think I can do that. The thing we have to do is we have to get your mind needs more experiences and more data with these fears. The more you're able to do that, the better it's going to help you for some of the bigger exposures that you want to take on, like talking to that girl, like talking to your sweet mates. Um, I've got, I don't know if you've seen it yet, but I've got a video on um, a a guide on how to do exposure therapy. Um, So I'm going to put a link in this video to that. um, And I'll also offline, I'll I'll send you a direct link to that. And and you can kind of go from there and see, uh, and see how things develop. All right, that sounds great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul, for being on the show. Thanks for this question. I, I know a lot of people are struggling with this as well, and I know this is going to help a lot of people just to hear where you're at, and hopefully our conversation will, um, will help people to get in the place that they want to be. Do you All struggle right. with social anxiety, or have you practiced uh, facing your fears in social situations let me know in the comments below and if you want to join the psych show and join this call-in show check out the link in the description below where you can sign up and then maybe you and i will be on a conversation together